the next session is very, very interesting because we will have a chance to talk to one of the fastest growth startups that in this era. And now, I would like to present to you Mr. Nick Nash, Group President at Garena Online. And this session will be moderated by John Russell, writer from TechCrunch, on the topic that how to build a unicorn from scratch, the story behind Garena. Please give a warm welcome. Okay, hi everyone. I'm John from, from TechCrunch and I'm very pleased to have Nick from Garena here. So I think uh, it's not a huge audience yet because everyone's coming back from having some food. Um, but I think we should probably get started, Nick, shall we? Let's get, let's get started. So let's, let's start with a question that I like to ask people who work for big companies. So uh, you work for We're not that Garena. big a company. <laughs> Well, well let, let's, let's establish first if you're a big company. So you guys just raised some funding recently, right? In March time. Can you tell us how much you raised and what the, the valuation of the, of the company is after that round? Yeah, we, we've always been rather shy about discussing valuations. As well, let, let, let's not be shy, Nick. Let, let's get straight to it. Come on. <laughs> so how much did you raise? The valuation of the company, please, sir. J John is a good friend, so I'll, I'll perhaps be more candid than I should be. Uh, we were very, very pleased and grateful to raise $170 million of fresh capital, primary capital, uh, from two very, uh, I think, very distinguished shareholders. One is Kazana National, which is the sovereign investment fund uh, of the government of Malaysia, and an extremely canny uh, and, uh, and, and proactive investor. They've been in Alibaba, WeLab, Blipper, many, many other high-quality companies. And then one of our existing shareholders, uh, Tencent, also reinvested in the round, as they have in each of our previous rounds. And they've been just a fantastically supportive, quote-unquote, elder brother for us over the years. The valuation, we, we really truly can't say it publicly, but the Wall Street Journal mentioned a number just south of $4 billion, which is in the right bailiwick. Uh, for the so, sorry, just, just south of $4 billion. Just south of $4 okay, billion. Okay, so that must make you guys one of the biggest uh, tech companies in Southeast Asia, right? I, I suppose so, but you know, <laughs> si size is often the enemy of growth, so perhaps it's a dubious okay. distinction. So I, I think perhaps maybe people uh, understand your business in certain ways. So you guys do a, like a few d different things, so maybe you can uh, explain to the audience, like, what, what is Garena? Like, what, what businesses yeah. do, you, do you run? No, I'd be happy to, and uh, I'm really happy to have a few of my colleagues in the audience. Uh, Kun Nok, who's sitting back over there, is the CEO of our Thailand operations, uh, right, right in the middle here, and uh, has been an extraordinary leader, and really a role model uh, for, for the business. Uh, maybe I'll just give you a 45-second introduction to what we do, and I'd love to hear questions from the audience if there's things that are on your mind that I, I could be helpful with. And I'll just start by saying that it's very humbling to be here. We have so much more to learn from each of you in terms of your knowledge of Thailand, your knowledge of entrepreneurship. We're not that much older than many of the people in this room. We're, we're sort of young, 30-something entrepreneurs trying to build a business that, that hopefully will, will stand the test of time. Uh, my business partner and, and very good friend, Forrest, who went to business school with me and Noak, uh, uh, started the business in 2009. And the vision was to try to bring some of the best internet business models that had really taken root in China and to see if they could be adapted and made hyper-local for Southeast Asia. Does that mean that you are, uh, you are co copying from China? No, no, quite, quite the opposite, Copy actually. Copycat style or inspired by? No, I think very much inspired by. It's okay. I, just, I just wanted to ask that question because it's, it's kind of, there's a, there's, a, there's a fine line, right, between no, it's, being it's, inspired. It's, it's a very important question, John. It's funny, you know, I was much younger when I was 18 years old. I was at a conference and I happened to have the incredible stroke of good luck to bump into George Lucas. The, of course, the, the, the visionary behind Star Wars, and I just walked up to the man and said, Mr. Lucas, I'm so inspired by how original your movies have been. And he said, son, I've never had an original idea in my life. I've simply been inspired by Kurosawa and by many other directors. And I think in the same, same sort of way, we've had a few original ideas, but we've been deeply inspired by what's worked. And here's what I mean by that. We took two things away from what had worked in other countries, particularly China, but, but, but all other parts of the world. Number one, chat was going to become the new paradigm for how internet businesses right, work. So th this is back in, what, 2009? 2009, and back then chat okay. was PC chat, not mobile. Today it's PC and mobile. And just like the web browser was the paradigm for the 90s, I think there's a very strong argument that the chat experience is the paradigm for internet in the 2010s and 2020s. And the second thing that we realized is that there were certain business models like search, where at least in Southeast Asia, without the Great Firewall of China, we were not going to be competitive versus Google. We were not going to reinvent RDMS the way Oracle has, or we're not going to reinvent ERP like SAP. But there were three things that we could do. 
We could build a fantastic content business, again, married to chat. We could build a fantastic e-commerce business married to chat. And we could build a fantastic payments business that was very local that could be a shared utility that the content business and the e-commerce business both drew upon, a well for both of those fields. And that's exactly what we've tried to do over the last seven years. We got started with content uh, for two reasons. One is it's a natural when you have a chat platform like we did in 2009. People love to assemble groups of friends and play games together. And games have now even become esports in a very massive way. And Bangkok is a great example of that. The second business we launched was a payments business because partly out of necessity, partly out of, I think, strategy, we were paying so much money to third party payments providers. If, you, if you're lucky enough to have a customer with a credit card, you get to pay Visa 2.5% or 3%. If you're not lucky enough to have a customer with a credit card, you can pay a telco 25%. So, so, the, so, the, payments, so the, the games business started first, right, Nick? And That's the exactly payments right. business, what, uh, what, what kind of time frame did you launch that? We launched that about 28 months ago. And since that point, it's grown to just under half a billion dollars of throughput of what people would say a GTV, gross transaction volume. And just to put that into context, our sense is that that probably makes it the second largest fintech slash payments business in Southeast Asia. But it's embedded, integrated into what we do. And out of that just under half a billion, about 20 to 25 percent of that volume comes from ourselves. And the rest comes from business partners of ours that are accessing okay. our network. Okay. And the, and the third pillar, right? So we were talking about this earlier. You, you've got the games business, which is, which is where you first started out with the chat, chat kind of hooked into, in, into gaming, right? The payments business that you say you, you started that after you'd found like a, like a pain point as a, as a, as a commerce company, That's right? That's exactly it. And then the third pillar is? The third pillar is marketplace e-commerce. And that goes back to the original strategy, which was just like in other parts of the world, especially emerging markets, you could build a really authentically local e-commerce business around marketplaces. We felt that Southeast Asia could have the exact same dynamic. And we, we, we came to that decision with a couple of strong beliefs. Number one, it was all about empowering small and mid-sized businesses. And I don't mean that in a politically correct way or a CSR way. We certainly like that. But we actually felt that economically, small businesses are truly the backbone of any economy. Again, just look at China. Jack Ma talks all the time about how important his sellers are and how he's changing their lives. Today, we have a million sellers on the Shopee platform, some small, some very, very big. And they're all given an equal opportunity to act as the customer. The second belief we had is that we had to leapfrog not just to mobile, we had to leapfrog to app. And there's a lot of angst that goes into the decision process as to if you're building an e-commerce business, should you be on PC web, should you be on mobile web, should you be in mobile app, or some combination of the three. We felt that supporting three different technology stacks simultaneously, three different experiences, wouldn't be as elegant and as coherent as a single one. So we made perhaps the limiting decision to go straight to mobile app only, but that's been a good decision in retrospect. And then the last thing that we decided to do, and I think against the advice of you know, many other folks in the community, was instead of launching one country and let's see how it goes, guys, and if it succeeds, then we'll kind of get the next one, we were a little bit like you know, a, a blockbuster movie that launches every country in the world simultaneously. We launched every major economy in Southeast Asia and Taiwan in a four-week period in the local language with local payments. And it took a lot of work to get to That's that That's going to be expensive, right? So how much money do you, have you put into the business? Yeah, actually, a the fairly, business, yeah, actually a fairly modest amount of money. And uh, I can say this just you know, publicly, our customer acquisition cost for Shopee, our CAC, which you know, goes into any investor presentation or any sort of measure, we think based on our data for a few of you know, other the folks in the community, it's about a third to a quarter of what other firms pay. And a lot of that is the virality of the chat centricity. A lot of that is being part of the broader greener framework. A lot of that, I think, is just really fantastic grassroots marketing that Kunok and Kun Chris have done to build a business. And the second thing about it is, again, we're a pure marketplace. We have no inventory. We have no warehouses. We have no giant cardboard box warehouses like in the Indiana Jones movie. None of that stuff. So as a result, our cost structure is just our cost structure. We don't have to worry about maintaining an enormous amount of fixed cost the way that other friends of ours in the market have to maintain. So actually, the cash burn has been very, very moderate, and the unit economics have been very surprisingly good for us. OK, so you launched uh, sh uh, sh Shopee, which Shopee. is this, this, uh, this, this commerce app, right? But I mean, it seems like e-commerce in Southeast Asia, I mean, there are so many companies that are doing um, that. And they've been going for like a long time, like Rocket Internet, obviously, sort of yeah. four or five years ago, put two companies in here, spent like a, uh, $1 billion between two of them. Yeah. So what is it that you're doing with, uh, sh with yeah. Shopee that is so different to yeah. everyone else? What, why do you think that uh, it, can, it can win the 
e-commerce race in Southeast Asia? No, it's a really good question, and I'll, I'll just be super direct as to how we feel the market is going to shake out. Uh, th this is one of those classic moments when, you know, sorry to be geeky, guys, but industrial economics, actual strategy, really, really matters in terms of outcomes. And I was sharing this with John over breakfast this morning. We feel very strongly as business people, not as management consultants, but as business people, that there are four places to play in e-commerce in Southeast Asia and, and, frankly, the rest of the world. And it hinges on two key decisions you have to make as a business person. One is, are you going to be asset light and have a pure marketplace, or are you going to be asset heavy and have those cardboard boxes and the two-wheelers, four-wheelers, all the real estate around that? The second decision is a little bit more subtle. Are you going to be triple C heavy, which is largely consumer electronics? Triple C stands for computers, cameras, cell phones. That tends to be about a 6 or 7% gross margin business, skews more mail, infrequent repurchase, but large ticket size. Or are you going to be non-triple C, which is sort of the other 80, 90% of discretionary consumer spending, which is more apparel, home and living, baby products, all the stuff you're wearing right now, all the stuff in your house. And it turns out that that tends to be more of a 30 to 40% gross margin business. So if you're just thinking as business people in terms of the return on invested capital, you want the invested capital to be low, meaning asset light, and you want the return to be high, meaning a high gross margin set of categories. That means of those four different choices you can make, you know, here or here, here or here, two times two, the best place to place in the upper right. That's exactly where Taobao and Tmall have der derived most of its market cap. That's where the juice and the lemon in. And to contrast that to JD.com, which is a great business, but in the lower left, that's asset heavy, triple C heavy, not exclusive, but, but a triple C heavy. That's a $35 billion market cap company compared to a $200 billion market cap company for, uh, for Alibaba. So to answer your question, John, you know, like Deng Xiaoping said, a thousand flowers can bloom. Everybody's going after these different cells, but very few have gone after the cell we've gone after, which we find puzzling, but it also happens to be the most lucrative segment. The vast majority of companies numerically are in what I would say is the lower right, which is asset heavy, non-electronics. Think of this as a fashion website, which curates about a thousand SKUs. Or maybe it's a home and living website. And again, they have an inventory, they have a warehouse, they arrange for all the delivery and merchandising. And that's a situation where it'll all be about category selection, merchandising, kind of branding of the self. A little bit like you go to the shopping mall across the street and there's one big anchor tent and lots of tiny little fashion stores. But ultimately, the equilibrium is one big player that's asset light, non triple C, probably one big player that's asset heavy, electronics heavy, a la uh, from where you're from, a car phone warehouse, from where I'm from, a Circuit City or Best Buy. And then everybody else will be niche players in this marketplace. And that's exactly how we see it evolving. Okay, but as a as a consumer who is who is going to be out there buying pr products, what are you, what are you doing differently to like Zalora, Lazada, like uh, other guys that are there? I mean, are yeah. you going to to merchants and offering them like favorable terms that only work with you? Like, wh what's the kind of because I mean, you've got to actually get those those products out there, and there's totally. already a lot of companies that have that have got that. So how do you take yeah. that inventory from them? Well, I'll, I'll jump to the the results, and I'll tell you that the why around the what. The, the, the what here is in about 12 months, we've been very proud. We've gotten to about a million sellers on the platform, which is you know at least 20 or 30x our nearest competitor that's trying to go after the entire region. So something is working here in terms of why sellers are fine. What's, but the question is, what is, what is, it? is it? What is it? You, you know what it is, right? <laughs> so I think, that, right? I think there's, there's, there's no one silver bullet, but there's a couple things that work really well. I think number one is an intense focus on the seller's needs. And that's both in terms of product, but also it's in terms of our behavior. For example, because we keep no inventory, we will never compete with a seller. So if you know, there are other platforms out there that sort of begin to notice, ah, oh, that's a category that's growing really well. Maybe we should do that. Send a man to Shenzhen. He'll go bring back four pallets of that, and then we'll begin to sell it. The sellers have our commitment. We will never do that. If anything, we will go out of our way to help them procure from around the world. The second element, though, is a pretty rigorous attention to what a seller needs to run their business. And here's what I mean by that. You know, John, if you decide to, to set up your own e-commerce store in Shopee or any e-commerce platform, you're going to need about fifteen dollars or $20,000 of working capital. You're going to need to figure out some sort of escrow system to get paid. You're going to have to figure out a way to get the customer to sort of come to you. All those little tools, all those sort of services are very well integrated into Shopee, including the shipping and logistics and payment and so on and so forth. And then I think the last element, honestly, of it is it's a little viral because this is an open marketplace. A lot of the customers themselves become sellers and a lot of the sellers themselves become customers. So we call it the Airbnb effect. I'm sure someone else has come up with that before we have, but on Airbnb, you find that a lot of the consumers will, will go to an Airbnb you know, in Italy for the weekend and say, this is kind of cool, and then they'll go back home to New York City where they have a second apartment, and they'll rent that out to somebody. So we're seeing that sort of up, down, up, down, 
cross-pollination really helping us? Is there any chance that you might break some of these companies out into their own like standalone businesses, or are you happy to sort of keep them under under the main umbrella? I think for now we're really happy keeping them under one umbrella, and as much as they are distinct brands, in fact, it's funny, for the first six months, most people didn't even realize Shopee was part of Garena. It just sort of, <laughs> it popped up out of the, out of the ether. Uh, but we, we love having them under roof, one roof, I think for two reasons. Uh, one is, it's a great source of career rotations. So we may have someone that's passionate about games, does it for two or three years and says, okay, I'm looking for my next challenge. We rotate them into Shopee and vice versa. So it's a bit GE-like where, you know, as your seniority and your experience increases, you get to play different roles in the company and people really love that. It, it, variety is the spice of life. But more substantively, more strategically, we love the fact that we're two massive use cases, the gaming use case and the e-commerce use case linked by a single wallet a single payment engine, and John and I were chatting this morning, and I said, you know, imagine sort of a hypothetical dinner that could have happened 10 years ago where Pony Ma and Jack Ma met together and said, you know what, we'll each do our own things, but let's have one wallet. Let's not have a competition or a, co or a, a confusion between Alipay and, and WePay. And that's effectively what we've built inside of our business, and breaking off Shopee what might, might lose a little bit of that magic. Okay, so let's talk about you, because you've come to an event and you're looking very, very smart. Most people who are out there, sort of like me, I guess, jeans, <laughs> t-shirt. Um, you know, I'm, you're working for a very big company, right? Your, I, I, your background. I'm too fat to fit so, into jeans and t-shirts. Uh, I, I can't pull that off like John Russell. So, so let's, let, let's talk about you. So how did you end up here uh, yeah. working for like a big, a big uh, startup company? Are you guys still a startup? Or? I think we think we're a startup. Okay. I mean, we, we run like a startup every day. We're... we're you know, one of, one of our teachers, one of my teachers when I was at Stanford, I was so fortunate and just incredibly honored to have a chance to learn from Andy Grove. And he was in his final years of his life and, you know, already you could see the, I think it was either Parkinson's or Alzheimer's beginning to affect his motor coordination, but his mind was quick as a whip and he would always remind us, like his famous book, that only the paranoid survive. So the minute you stop thinking of yourself as a startup, you're, you're, you're a goner. You have to think like a startup. Okay, so you at GA, right? for 15 years? Just, just under, 2002 to 2014. Okay. So what happened? So you decided to go into tech uh, startups. Like what, what was the process of you from going f from a huge company, right, like GA, to a, to a smaller, you know, obviously yeah. now Green is big, but at, the, at, at that time you weren't as big. I, I, I joke with my that? wife that it was sort of Stockholm Syndrome. You know, I, 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 be, I went over to the side of my captors. No, but what, what happened was uh, I, I was uh, uh, with uh, the firm General Atlantic from, again from 2002 to 2014. GA has grown up a lot over the years and it's become one of the largest private equity groups with a real focus on technology. And GA was one of the early investors in Alibaba and Facebook and, and a bunch of others, eBay, and, uh, sorry, uh, E-Trade and a few other ones. And... Uh, after, after uh, 12 years with the firm, uh, on my next rotation, I, I was the CEO of Southeast Asia, my next rotation was to come back to New York City, and it was a kind of a fun job to work for GA's CEO and sort of be his aide-de-camp. And about six weeks before we were gonna get started with the move, Forrest asked me out to lunch and said, look, you've just closed your investment in Garena, we're having a ton of fun working together, do you really wanna go back to a 2% GDP growth country? Or would you rather stay in Southeast Asia and have the, the, the sense of building something and really be part of a team that's gonna make something? And the phrase he uses often when he's closing people to try to hire them is he says, don't you wanna do something that your children are gonna be proud of one day? That's a pretty powerful closing speech. And so basically, so GA, you led investment deal in, in Garena and then you came over to join Garena. Uh, right? About six or seven months. So I find this fact. fascinating because Garena for the longest time was a company that as someone who worked in the media, we could never get hold of you, right? Nobody ever comments on anything. You guys raise funding quietly. There's never an announcement. There's never even a response, right? And yeah. I can respect that. You know, you build it, you're busy building a business. And suddenly this guy pops up, and you're at every event under the sun, right? Oh dear. So, so oh dear. What's, what's, your, what's your role at oh dear. Garena? What, what, are you, what are you doing? Are you preparing the company for an IPO, fundraising, just being friendly and saying hello to everybody at events? What's the, what's the reason that you've, that you've come to the, to the company? We, we just can't say no to John Russell. I mean, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 serious answer. You, you, can't, you can't give me that answer. Like, what, what, what's the real reason? What's your, what's your yeah. role at Garena? It's, it's, it's funny. I think... Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll wax philosophical for just 20 Give seconds. Give us a natural answer, right, Nick? <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So, let, let me answer the question. So, some of you may have heard of something called the Myers-Briggs type. It's basically a way of thinking about personality in the workplace and in relationships. And if I were to pick a Myers-Briggs type for Garena, I'd say that we're INTJs. 
we're a bit introverted as a company. And to that end, in the last couple of years, at the Greener corporate level, we've only issued two press releases in 24 months. Is that why you don't answer me when I ask That's questions? why we, don't, we blow okay. this guy off. That's right. <laughs> it's not you, John. <laughs> no, but jokes apart, I think over the years we've felt that sometimes being humble, being quiet from a PR standpoint is often just a great way to keep us focused on the business. But we've learned two things. The first is that uh, as we grow, if we don't play a more engaged role with the community, we aren't really fully fulfilling our potential, and as a part of that, we're gonna, you're gonna see us do many, many more projects around social enterprise and CSR in the coming years. We wanna be more sort of involved and active in our communities. And the second thing, frankly, is that as we wanna hire more and more people, because it, it was easy to hire 100 people a year back in 2010, we're hiring almost 1,000 people a year right now, it's actually helpful to be more engaged in the communities and have moms and dads know what their, what their daughter is gonna go do for a living when they come work for us, so. So what, what, what kind of folks are you, are you, are you, are you hiring now? What yeah. kind of, um, is there anybody in the audience, like what kind of type are you looking for to hire now? Quick kind of plug, if uh, you want. Yeah, well no, it's, it's not? You're, you're very kind to do that. I think f for, for us, we're obviously looking for very talented, smart, hardworking people, but when we hire people, we actually look for five behaviors, which we call the Green of Five Values. And you know, look, a lot of people in Southeast Asia have heard propaganda their whole lives, either from, you know, from the media or this yeah. or that. And what I, <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what I mean by that is you know, in terms of marketing or in terms of sort of, you know, right. for those that have come from, from Northern Asia, for example, who move here, have often been sort of gone through a certain process where things have been very specific. We're cynical of that, so we thought that we should be very specific about the behaviors that drive success. The first one is called We Serve, where we have to have a mindset of serving the customer in every which way we can. Many tech companies, as that wonderful Silicon Valley show on TV illustrate, can be a little narcissistic. We don't want to be like that. The next one is we run. We want people that can move swiftly, that always think about doing things today that won't wait until tomorrow. We adapt. You must run, but keep your eyes open. Uh, we commit. We want the sort of people that, you know, you don't have to remind them what was in their job description for them to do what they need to do. They, they're proactive. They, they, they stick to what is sort of the mission. And finally, the most important one is we stay humble. And what I mean by that is, intellectual honesty, interpersonal authenticity, a lot of that begins with just humility. And if you find people that are already humble, they often tend to be secure in their skins and happy with who they are, comfortable with their own personal you know, development needs and flaws and strengths, and those people tend to be very successful. So, so how, how many staff do you guys have at this point? We have about 4,600 people, That's a lot of people in the region. In the region. So, yeah. so, I mean, I guess the title of our panel was about how to build a unicorn from scratch. We've not mentioned that whatsoever, so I should probably ask you some questions about that, right? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so as a, as, a, as a company that's valued almost $4 billion with 3,000 people, how do you maintain the culture of a, of yeah. a small startup? <clears throat> I think um, there's, there, there's a couple things that have been successful, and Kun Nok in the audience can talk about this on the panel she'll be doing later in the day. Uh, one is the right balance between centralization and decentralization, and this is one of those classic dilemmas that every company has to deal with as it gets bigger. What gets decided in home office? What gets decided in the regions? And we've elected to create frameworks and sort of broad brace recipes for what we want to do, and then give a lot of autonomy to the local leadership. Uh, and they can see each of our three businesses. You know, Kunok's a great example again, because in Thailand we have a very flourishing air pay business, a shoppy business, and a game business, and figure out how to make those pieces fit together. So that's part of it. So it's like having small companies in different regions. Uh, it's exactly unified, right. Unified, I guess. That's exactly right. And it's brand. not quite having franchises, it's having, you know, businesses within the whole, but enough local judgment. And, and do you guys still do fun startup stuff like outings or expeditions or like company bonding? We do a lot of that stuff, but it's done frugally. I mean, we don't do the, the kind of over the top stuff that Silicon Valley does, but you know, we do a ton of just dinners at homes. We do a ton of outdoorsy stuff. There's a big basketball and sort of, you know, soccer culture at Garena. So, you know, it's a bit of a work hard, play hard thing. And that's a little bit of the culture that, uh, that a bunch of us brought back from California when we were on grad school. So there. I guess we, we, we sort of never got to the reason that what's your job, because you managed to like avoid that, that question. No, I'm happy to But I mean, it. I kind of know the answer already. So, I, I would, so, so basically, you're, you're the sort of public face of the company, right? I, I think I do two things. One is I do a lot of our external engagement, which is business development, some commercial negotiations. Inevitably, I think shareholder stuff fits into that as well, our capital process, uh, all the M&A targets we look at, the investments that we make. So that's the... The, the, the financially oriented, commercially oriented, and the other element of it is I, I, I try to think about our brand. 
and the way we engage with the community in a more active way. And I'll, I'll tell you this, I, mean, I worked at a large tech company in the 1990s. I'll, I'll leave their name off of it to not, to not, not, not to embarrass them. And I felt that particular company was decidedly bad at engaging with the community. It had so many smart people, it had so much resource available to it, but it never invested in tech startups. It never sort of showed up to incubation events to be a sponsor. You know, we want to be really active in, in sharing what we've learned. Are you going to share the money you've got? Are you going to invest in companies? We have about 12 so far. Uh, okay. in the most prominent one is Redmart, but we've also invested in Foodie in Vietnam. We have three different investments in Indonesia, including Beribanka and Bilna, which is now Orami. And we play a pretty active role in all so these all companies. it's e-commerce, really, at this point, right? Uh, e-commerce, uh, a lot of food-related stuff. We, we thought that was an interesting area. So it's just things that you like, right? You want to go shopping, you want to eat food, you invest in companies. <laughs> that's, the, that's the modus, right? Well, we are a consumer company, so hopefully some okay. consumers like what we're investing in. But we try to find things that are orthogonal to what we actually do. So none of our investments are in other marketplaces. You know, Bill Nunn, yeah. Bank are sort of B2C companies. Okay, what about going public? So obviously, as one of the biggest companies in Southeast Asia, and, and there are now like quite a few, so the last couple of years, you know, like uh, obviously G G Grab Taxi is kind of growing pretty quickly. Lazada was pretty big, and obviously Ali Alibaba invested in them. You know, there hasn't yet been a major sort of tech I IPO from S Southeast Asia. I'm not going to be on the spot here because I know that you said in public before that you'd like to take the the company public, right? So how do you see, like, do you think that uh, these unicorn companies in, 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 in Southeast Asia can, can go public? I mean, how, how do you see the, 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 the future exits? Because obviously, if you get this big, right, to sort of uh, $4, four billion, dollars, what can you do next, right? Unless, you know, someone like t Tencent buys you, for example, like IPO is the best route. So how, how do you see this, 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 this region? Like, obviously, you guys are like setting the pathway for other companies that are, that are, that are following you. Do you see IPOs as being a big thing for Southeast Asia? No, I, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely, for all sorts of good reasons. And I've gone publicly on the record to say that just like China today has about 600 billion of publicly traded internet and mobile market cap, which is sort of really Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, Alipay, and, and a few other things, some public, some private. Uh, if you just scale that down to the GDP of Southeast Asia plus Taiwan, that would suggest that there's the potential for 150 billion of market cap in companies in this part of the world. And that's not a bad analysis so because if you guys are four billion that's a lot of space right I think there's a lot of space less, there's a less lot four. of space to grow into and again if you look at Tencent and Alibaba just five years ago each of them has had over a 35 percent IRR to the shareholders they were all sort of in the 50 billion dollar range five years ago and they've grown into their current 200 billion dollar range but let me be more specific about this I think number one uh, there are several companies in Southeast Asia today that could go public right away if they wanted to uh, I think the deeper question is what conditions have to exist in the company for it to be a successful public company and what has to happen in the market. I'll just give you two sides of that story. One is the brutal reality about the North American markets, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, is that if you're less than a $5 billion market cap, you're just not going to get that much attention. You may have an IPO with ringing the bell and a lot of hullabaloo and fanfare, but the really important question is in the aftermarket over the next three or four years, are you going to have more than one or two analysts writing your quarterly report? Are you going to have engagement? Is there going to be liquidity in your stock? And if there isn't, it's a bit of a failed effort. So we want to make sure that we're at a size and scale where there's enough, I think, demonstrable interest in the stock to be a successful public company. On the other side of it, and we're very fortunate not to be in this position because we've, we've had very supportive and I think very uh, aligned investment rounds where the security has been quite, quite healthy for the company. But if I look more broadly in Asia, there are a lot of our friends that are in fairly large, mid-sized, you know, two to $10 billion value private companies who have put in so much preferred stock and so many ratchets and so many downside clauses. Names. names. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine the names, John. And the problem is if they wanted to go public today, it may very well be at a ratchet down from where their last private round is. And it's incredibly awkward. In fact, one of the terms that I would encourage entrepreneurs in this room to pay very close attention to is something very technical, but it has an incredibly important role in your future. It's something called a QIPO, a QIPO. And a QIPO basically is the kind of IPO that your investors will say, okay, you know what? We're gonna let you do this and we're gonna convert from preferred into common. And increasingly, you're seeing clauses that the quipo has to be at a lift to your current valuation, or at least at your current valuation. And that may seem very good at the time you're signing your deal, but can be very damaging two or three years from now when the company needs capital and can't go public. So we're very fortunate. Our quipo language is very benign to the company. But I'd be very careful for those in the room as you're taking capital to be very mindful of that clause, because it can limit your ability to go public, as many of the companies, for example, in India today, would love to go public, but have some challenges doing that. 
Okay, so you've got a little bit more time. Uh, can you tell us, obviously, you guys have started in games, and we, as we've already talked about, into payments, into commerce. What can we expect to come uh, next from you, just quickly? There's something nice about the number three, and I don't mean to be kind of goofy about this, but truly, when you're running a business of this scale, having three core businesses that fit together really nicely, that's juggleable, if you will. But four is a perfect square, so that <laughs> makes more sense, right? <laughs> and five's a pentagram. I mean, you can go on and on and on. <laughs> but it becomes an issue of focus and bandwidth. My three's a crowd as well, by the way. Three's a crowd, yeah, exactly. My, four's my better. <laughs> Pairs. My personal preference is to stick to these three, but to deepen them deeply. So I'll just give an example. We've begun thinking about how could you take AirPay, which is right now a payments network, what if the money went in the other direction? Instead of the consumer paying, what if the consumer or the small business was receiving a mid-sized loan on behalf of a large bank in the country that didn't necessarily have a low-cost way to get to that consumer? Could you underwrite that loan in a better way than a bank could? Could you deliver it at a lower cost of transaction cost? Could you even have a form of recourse, for example, if they're on your Shopee platform or one of your game cyber cafes, that's a little different than just a generic bank trying to have a contractual legal recourse? We've been thinking about that a little bit. We've done a couple pilots, and it's been very impressive. Our, our non-performing loans in the pilots we've done have been about one-seventh of what traditional small business lending has been in the country we tried it. So what I'd like to do is take each of these three businesses and make them more special. In the game business, we're getting into mobile in a big way. Over time, we'll get into virtual reality and AR in a big way. That's just the nature of entertainment. In our payments business, I described financial services. In our shoppy business, you'll just see that deepening and deepening and deepening. I think if we can do these three things right, growing from four billion into that 150 billion, and we won't take all of it, we won't even take more than a fraction of it, becomes an accomplishable goal, John. Awesome, Nick. Thank you so much. I could ask you so many more questions, but unfortunately, we're out of time. So, Nick Nash, thank you so much. Thank you, John. <laughs>